from the studios of Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello, everyone. I'm Kawhi Leonard's new agent, also known as Jamie Hickson, joined by my longtime friend over the phone. The hottest, baddest, sexiest man on cable <coughs> access TV, yours truly, Hector Bosa. That's right. I'm going to try to convince you that he should go to the New York Knicks. And He's that's going to be a very hard task because you're a Nick hater. You're, never, you're not a Nick lover. You're a Nick hater. But let's I'm, go no, to I'm the, not let, a Nick hater. I'm let, a Nick let's management go, let's hater. Go, let's go to There's the a topic difference. of football for a moment. The Giants have made certain transactions. What do you think of them so far? Hate the Odell Beckham Jr. trade with a burning passion. They got absolutely, well, they got peanuts for him, basically. A couple of draft picks and Jabril Peppers, who's a, a decent player, but not one I would call an, an all-pro or a pro bowler. Th that trade never, ever, ever should have been made in the first place. And it made Dave Gettleman look like a liar. Especially when you consider that he was the one that said, you don't trade away a talent like that. Or you don't give up on a talent like that. But he made that deal, which means he made that mess, which means he has to clean it up. I also am not in love with the Daniel Jones pick in the draft either. If they really wanted a quarterback... Dwayne Haskins was available at number six. Or why couldn't they just make a trade for What's Josh up? Rosen? Up too late, he went to the Dolphins. So, yeah. And their other number one picks, Dexter Lawrence out of Clemson. Let's, uh, let's reserve judgment on, De on Dexter Lawrence because to be quite honest with you, the Giants really did need defensive players. But this leads back to what they should have done at number six. I thought that Josh Allen from Kentucky was right there for the taking, and they completely passed on him, and he wound up going to the next pick to Jacksonville. And there were so many other guys that the Giants could have and should have taken with their other draft picks. They, they, they practically had one of the five worst drafts in, uh, in, in, in all the NFL. I mean, their, draft, their drafting selections were right up there horribly with the Raiders and the Dolphins. Uh, I, I thought that um, this draft was also uh, sorely, sorely lacking on defensive backs. There were very few defensive backs that were taken in the first round. I think there were only two guys in the defensive backfield that were taken in the entire first round. I also thought that wide receiver was sorely lacking in this draft as well. But as far as what I thought of the Giants, the Giants had so far have had a putrid offseason. And right now, Dave Gettleman has subjected himself to basically uh, being on the firing line right now. And I love how this guy likes to say, well, just look at my resume and you'll see what I've done in the past. We don't care about what he did in the past. We care about what he did now. And right now, he screwed himself. Well, you have to care a little bit because there, there has to be a little bit of a track record because as we, as we both know, there's always some type of track record that we, we have to go by. The only track record... Sometimes. The only track record... Well, the only thing that he has on his track record go going back to the past was the fact that he drafted Cam Newton first overall. But that was just a, that was just a no-brainer there. That's not, a, that's not really a, an example of his uh, draft acumen. That was just an obvious choice that he made when he was running things in Carolina. Do you think that it was it, – so you don't think it was a good draft no. this year? No, this was not a good draft for the Giants at all. Overall, there was no franchise player that any team, 1 through 32, could look at and say, that's who, that's who I want to build my team around. 
There was well, some... What do you think of uh, Ryan Connolly or Darius Slayton? I mean, they're decent players, but not necessarily guys that they want to build around. Maybe to build with. That's one thing. There's a difference between building with a guy and building around a guy. Building around a guy means you want to make him the franchise player. None of these guys were franchise players. But Adrian Peterson... Uh, Adrian Peterson for a time Jabari was a Peppers. Adrian Peterson for a time was a, a was a franchise player for the Vikings, but then things really went south for him. First, when he mangled his knee, and second, when he got caught up in that uh, child abuse scandal a few years ago. As far as Jabril Peppers is concerned, he's a decent player, but. Not not necessarily one who I would think would replace Landon Collins. Let's put it that way. Uh, the re-signing of John Jenkins? Well, re-signing John Jenkins was practically because they needed depth on, uh, on the line. But there was also um, them bringing in the kid from, uh, from the Vikings, who they gave a one-year deal to. That was also to solidify... Their offensive line as well. What do you think of Lorenzo Carter? Not terrible, but again, not necessarily anyone who I would count on to be the guy. I mean, with all these people that they're signing, do you think that they are, they may not be the greatest players, but as a team, can they play well together? Honestly, I just don't see it. And... Another thing, what are they going to do with quarterback? Is Eli going to be the guy in his walk year? Or is he going to be thrust into a real competition with Daniel Jones? Keep in mind, Daniel Jones was never a great quarterback when he was with Duke. He was two games under 500 for his career, and he never threw for 3,000 yards in a season, in any season. And now he's being looked at to be the heir apparent I just don't see it. Well, you and a lot of people don't see it either, and a lot of people do see it. Because I sent you that clip of uh, of what the Giants, one of the an ex Giant GM, thought of him. He said it was the right pick. <laughs> of course he would, because he's always going to side with his former guys. Plain and simple, this was this was a, a, a stormy, stormy offseason that the Giants have had so far. Everything started snowballing for them after the Beckham trade. And quite honestly, I don't know how they're going to be able to get themselves out of this. They still don't have a number one receiver now that Beckham is gone. Right now, it's looking like the entire offense, I would, well, not the entire offense, but maybe 70% of their offense is going to have to go through Saquon Barkley. Well, here, here's another thing, too, and that is, <clears throat> you know, you got to figure that it's going to be a little bit of a competition now. Yeah, there is going to be a competition. With the quarterback. Mm-hmm. And how much of a leeway do you, let's say it's um, Eli Manning for instance. Yeah. And they go on a on a spiral losing streak. How much how much how many times do you have to lose before you bring in the second quarterback? <laughs> if they start the season at even at at 0 and 4, everybody's going to sound the alarm and say put in Daniel Jones. If they go, if they have the the type of start that they had last year, where they were zero and eight or one and eight, naturally they're they're going to want to see Daniel Jones put in, and everyone is going to want Eli to be benched for the rest of the season. Well, the Giants also signed Mike Remmers from the Vikings. Yeah, that was the guy that I referred to earlier. Gave him a one year deal. And they're going to make him a starter on the left side of the line. How do you see the starting lineup? 
as far as the, as far as the entire yeah eleven right man there. rotation right. on exactly. offense. Yes. At this rate, I still see Eli as the starting quarterback. Okay. Th- there's just a strong loyalty to this guy, and I, I think it has to do with past history that they're still sticking with the guy. And you should. You should stick with the guy that got you to the dance. Mm-hmm. Eventually, you're going to have to change your shorts. Yeah. But, um, you know, you still have to go with, your, you know, your bread and butter. Yeah. Your favorite shorts, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, who, who's, your, who's your front line? The front line, it, it's looking more and more like it's going to be the newcomer that they brought in from the Vikings and maybe Jenkins and maybe the other guys that they had from last year, which is not really saying a lot. Adding one guy to the line is not really uh, telling me a lot. And there's still the issue of wide receiver. Sterling Shepard is the only holdover from last year. Getting Golden Tate is okay, but that's all he's been for his career. He's just been okay for, for the game. They need, they need great. They had that with Beckham, and for some reason, they decided to, to trade him away. What do you think of Freedom Akatotombo? Who are you talking about? The guy's name... The guy's name is Freedom. It must be one of the kids uh, that they drafted. Uh, Kim Mladen. That must be one of the kids that they drafted, maybe. Yeah. I mean, what do you think of him? I mean, he's a decent prospect, but at this rate, I'm not sure that putting him in the starting lineup is just is such a, a good idea. And there's also the manner. There's also the matter of that kid that they brought in uh, off the scrap heap last year. He was playing reasonably well, and then all of a sudden, he wound up tearing his Achilles. Is he going to be brought back to be the guy to try and do some type of help on that line? We're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, at least you have Shaquan, which which is a very big help, but how much of a load can he carry for you? Mm-hmm. You know, and that that's hard. That that that's hard. And and you know, every single defensive line is going to be a lot more loaded, having four, five, six, maybe even seven guys on the line, maybe eight guys on the line, just to try and guard him. The only thing, the only saving grace is that it'll probably open up the passing game for Eli. But again, who's he going to throw to? Is it going to be Golden Tate? Is it going to be Sterling Shepard? Then the Giants needed a guy that was going to help them stretch the field, and they all and out dumped the guy. And there's also going to be uh, the issue of tight end. Evan Ingram was. <laughs> a little banged up last year. He had some flashes of greatness, but he has to be healthy for 16 games if he's going to try and help the Giants' passing game in any way. How about Ty Tolbert? You're going to have to give me a little bit of an idea on him. Ty Tolbert confident in his receivers? Then that that must be... Uh, one of the coaches. Yeah, right? one of one of the coaches right there. He, he's going to be missing Beckham a whole lot. But at least he's got Shepard, who's a good secondary receiver, and at least he's got Golden Tate, who's a good possession receiver, but not necessarily a guy you can throw the ball to five to ten times in a game. It looks like this, this job is going to be for Sterling Shepard. Do you see the Giants, let's say, being in fourth place, fifth place, or in last place? Well, fourth place is last place. And oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> considering how competitive the Eastern D- Division has gotten now, because not only did the Eagles get so much better bringing back Deshaun Jackson to be their uh, every down receiver and finally making Carson Wentz the guy at quarterback, there's still the issue of the Cowboys. The Cowboys were, were very strong last year with Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott. 
And now that they have this stud receiver, Amari Cooper, they're going to give opposing secondaries fits next season. That's if they have a good start, uh, a good beginning, because they just started coming in in the last, mm-hmm. you know, the last half of the season. Dallas wasn't that good in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And then they rallied and wound up winning the, the Eastern Division title. After the Eagles and the Cowboys, even the Redskins got better because now they have uh, the quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, who uh, could be the guy to take over for the now injured uh, Alex Smith because there's a strong possibility Alex Smith may never play football again because he broke his, he, he broke his leg really, really badly. And you, and you consider who the backup is, Colt McCoy, a guy who's uh, run hot and cold at the, be- at the most. The Redskins better hope that, Dak, that um, Dwayne Haskins has one really quick start to him in order to give the Redskins uh, a chance. But at this rate, I see the Redskins maybe being a third-place team right now. This Eastern Division is going to be down to the Cowboys and the Eagles. The Giants are going to bring up the rear. And you see them pick. You hopefully see them. Well, will the GM have a job next year if they do? <laughs> the way he, the way he's messed things up right now, I'm surprised he wasn't fired the day after the draft ended. Now, wouldn't that be on the owners themselves by going? What was he thinking of? Who? <laughs> why do you think they gave him a second chance? Even John Mara had to scratch his head when he found out about the Beckham trade. So if that doesn't give you cause for concern, then I don't know what will. Now, uh, the Jets, do you predict them um, making the playoffs? And if so, would that be... Good for them, or would that be a bust for them? Just if the them Jets were to the make the playoffs after an eight-year absence, that would be outstanding for them. But there's the issue of the uh, the, the the parts, the, the pieces to the puzzle that they have. I mean, they're set at quarterback with Darnold. I still don't see them getting a number one receiver. Sorry, but Robbie Anderson... And, and and Jermaine Curse are just not doing it for me. They need an Odell Beckham type that's going to really stretch the field for them. And they also don't have uh, a good enough offensive line that's really, really going to try and protect the quarterback. At least they have that one saving grace coming out of the backfield, and that's Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell should be able to get a ton of carries to try and lessen the load off of Sam Darnold for the time being. I also uh, think they need to get themselves a franchise tight end because the guys that they have were, they were just ordinary for me. Defensively, I think they have a chance to be really, really strong. Love the Quinn and Williams pick at number three. You put him in there with, Leonard Williams, and also Jamal Adams in the secondary, the Jets are going to be so much better. I think they could use a little bit more help um, at cornerback. I think they need uh, a little bit more depth at linebacker, too. But defensively, over, uh, overall defensively, they, they've gotten a tad better. They've gotten much younger, but they've gotten a tad better, though. As far as whether they make the playoffs or not, it's going to be hard. I mean, Buffalo, I, th- I think, is, is a, a sinking ship. Miami, I actually think, got better now that they have Josh Rosen as their quarterback. New England, th- th- they're going to own the AFC East once again. It's 50-50 for the Jets right now. I would have to see what their schedule is to, to see if they have a chance, but I would say it's 50-50 that the Jets are a playoff team right now. But here's the thing. You have the Jets making bigger splashes 
than the joints. Mm-hmm. And in some instance, some big splash in, in most teams. And not only did the Jets make a big <clears throat> splash, they did that by, uh, by filling a need, which was a, a franchise running back. And they got that in Le'Veon Bell. Now, he sat out all of last season. Granted, there's going to be a bit of rust that he's going to have to shake off. But the way the, the Jets offense is set up right now, I think Bell is the perfect guy to take all of the pressure off of Sam Darnold. At least Sam Darnold had one year where he had a lot of growing pains, but at the same time, he also had some flashes of, of uh, real potential. And also, you have the guy that didn't play for one year, so he should be well-rested that his, he didn't get his body knocked around either. He may have a little bit of a rust. That's right. He didn't, he didn't get, get his body knocked around, which means he's going to be exactly. really, really fresh. Exactly. And, you know, what we have here is that, again, the Jets, except for the ugly uniforms, I think they're horrible. I think that, that they, I don't know why people are, are making such a big deal about the, about the about the uniforms. Though. I like the old Jets uniforms. They were better. They, they're too. They, I I don't know. Some about the Jets uniform that really stink. But Uh-oh. as long as they don't play like their uniforms, then <laughs> then they'll be a good catch. They'll they'll make it. I think to the playoffs. If everything goes right, there's not a big major injury because you know how injuries go in, in the National Football League. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. If Donald goes down, do you rely on your 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 second quarterback? Can you rely on your second quarterback to come and, and do the job? Can you rely on your secondary to do the job if somebody's knocked down. Well, it depends on who that uh, secondary guy is behind Darnold. Well, whoever the quarterback is or whoever the front line is or defensive line, you have to remember that people are going to get hurt and Mm -hmm. you hope that they don't get hurt badly. Yeah. But um, so far, the Jets, I, well, according to, you know, WFAN, ESPN, and most of the uh, sports casters, the Jets seem to be going in the right direction, and the Giants seem to be going in a parallel direction. Not yeah. going backwards, but going in parallel. Uh, I just wonder what these guys in the giant front office are thinking. I mean, they say that they have a plan going, yet they executed it incorrectly. Well, I I think they just wanted to get a quarterback to appease everybody, but I don't think this was the the year to get the quarterback. Maybe last year... Last year, maybe, but then again, they would not. Be, they would not have been able to have gotten Saquon Barkley, who had an outstanding exactly. rookie season. Exactly. And let me and tell you, that kid's exactly. going to be a real star. So switching up a bit, you know, uh, WWE wrestler may have to retire. Which one? Sheamus. Really? Yes. A debilitating uh, he, injury, I presume. Yes. Uh, he had a concussion, but he also has something wrong with his back injury. Uh, uh, he's got a very bad back injury, the same one as Steve Austin had and Edge. My guess is uh, a herniated disc. It, it, well, it was something to that matter, but uh, here's the thing. He may have to retire, but you may not hear about it. Hmm. And that's so sad because whether you liked him or not, he performed. I mean, he had a good career. He was WWE champion. I think he was WWE tag team champion at, at uh, yes, another time. Yes, with Cesaro. Yeah. 
I mean, it and, wasn't like he was a flash in the pan. He he has had a very good career. Well, I I look at it as uh, he's he'll, he'll, he he was he's a good wrestler, and he deserves what he gets. Mm-hmm. Um, another wrestling news: Austin Aries announces that he's going to wrestle for MLW. Oh, Major League Wrestling. Yes. He, yeah. I didn't even know they were still around. Major League Wrestling and uh, uh, Lucha Libre star uh, Silver King. I heard about that. That I heard about that. One years old. I even saw the video clip of what happened. I, I he must have uh, suffered a heart attack. Yes, he did. He <sighs> did suffer a heart attack, and you know it's a shame. His brother is Dr. Wagner Jr. Yeah. And, uh, and also and, known in the, um, I forgot the organization now, uh, Mil Muertes. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, that that's a shame where you, he died where he wanted to die. Mm-hmm. Most wrestlers want to die in the ring. Now, I don't know if I want to be the opponent <laughs> for, to, for that to happen. <laughs> well, it turns but, out um, the opponent that he was facing when he passed away, it was the former WWE wrestler, Juventud Guerrera. <coughs> yeah. Who also um, has had a nice time over at uh, the old ECW. Yeah, I mean, they had some great matches. I mean, um, they had really great technical matches. And it was holy... It, it was heel versus heel and face versus face. Yeah. And this is what's wrong with, well, I'm not going to go even what's wrong with WWE. They're just flat out doing everything wrong right now. And when they switch to Fox and they have to go by ratings, they're going to lose a lot of money. The they, one, A lot like, of people are going to be seeing exactly what the problems are with that with that company and it's not so much to me now this is my personal opinion and that is it's i think it's vince mcmahon not trying to get up with the times yep i think that he doesn't push the right people anymore and i believe what what jim Cornette say says which is rotate the people that way you can have, because remember back in the 80s and even in the Attitude Era, all of them people you can believe that were champions. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there was only, you know, Steve Austin, The Rock, certain people were champions, but still you believe the other people could have been champions. And even back in the 80s, King Kong Bundy, I could believe him being a, a champion. Should have been a champion, but he, never was. You know, Jake the Snake Roberts was never a heavyweight champion. Roddy, Roddy Piper was never a heavyweight champion. No. So, yeah, so I could believe, you know, all them people. Neither was Jesse Ventura. A- exactly. So this, this, is what I, this is what I'm talking about, that most of them could have been champions. They were more believable. But now... There's nothing believable about the WWE. No. There really isn't. But um, uh, switching gears again, I wanted to ask you, you know, the Yankees are still losing people. Yeah. Once again, they lost uh, Miguel Andujar because of a shoulder injury. At least Aaron Hicks is coming back off the disabled list. He's supposed to make his uh, return tonight, but... Unfortunately, that rain is still uh, delaying things. But Andujar. He's, he's got a really serious so- shoulder injury. I think it's um, the rotator cuff in his shoulder, which might he, require a season-ending surgery, but he wants to hold off on that. You know what? I Some people would say don't get it, and some people would say do get it. I would say get it. Then that would put him out for the whole season. He yeah, but he's young enough to come back. He's a good enough player to to actually do something. He's mm-hmm. not a bad player. He's a very good player. 
So I think he should just get it and hope for the best and expect the worst because if he doesn't get eventually he's going to need it. Yeah. The the only saving grace to him possibly missing the entire season is the fact that uh they had they have a really impressive stopgap who has gotten so many big hits for them and has made so many great defensive plays at third. It's Gio Urshela. That kid who they plucked off the scrap heap during the spring, a guy who basically was in no man's land in, uh, in well, I think it was in the either the Angels or the Indians organization, he suddenly has played masterfully at the plate and at third base. And what about DJ LeMayhew, a guy who they signed basically to be um, a backup on the infield? He's been a starter at second base and, and, and third base. DJ LeMayhew has gotten a whole bunch of big hits. Over the weekend, he got a huge base hit to beat the Rays in a game. And he's, yes, he, he's, he's, he's been in the, the beginning of the season. He's been their savior. Who? What was the starting lineup in the beginning of the season? Well, defensively, was it Sanchez is catcher. Yeah, it was Gary Sanchez behind the plate. Supposed to be Luke Voigt and um, Greg Bird platooning at first, and then it was supposed to be Glaber Torres at second, and then Didi Gregorius at short, and then Miguel Andujar at third, and an outfield of. Brett Gardner, Aaron Hicks, and Aaron Judge with um, Giancarlo Stanton, the everyday designated hitter. But that has completely changed. Stanton is uh, hurt. Aaron Judge is hurt. Greg Bird has slumped so badly that you don't even hear from him again. So Luke Voigt has played every day at first base. The only regular who's been able to start almost every day is... Glaber Torres, and Glaber Torres has had a, a really solid season. After that, it's been LeMayhew, it's been Urshela, Brett Gardner has been taking a lot of the time in the, out, in the outfield. Did anyone see Cameron Mabin playing a lot of the time in center field and hit while, uh, while we're at it? No, not me. Cameron Mabin was basically... Uh, shuttling back and forth in between teams for the last three or four years. And because Aaron Hicks was hurt, Mabin was claimed off waivers from the Indians. And the next thing you know, Mabin is penciled into to play center field. He's playing great so far. He's only had like a few games, but he's done tremendously at the plate and in center field. And what are you going to do when – your regular guys start coming back, how do you rotate them in and out? Because eventually you're going to have to send people back down. Mm -hmm. Or designate some people for assignment. Exactly. So how do you tell the guy that's playing great for you that that's won more games than your regular starters go and say, you know what, guy, you have to go down now. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your work. We'll give you a big bonus later on. We'll do something for you. How well, do you sell them that? Well, in the case of a kid like Taito Estrada, who was promoted because um, they had holes on the infield because of the injuries, he knew that he was only going to be a stopgap for a short time, and he was a great stopgap. Stop gap. I mean, he's been hitting the ball tremendously. He's played outstanding defense. He has not been playing scared at all. He's been playing like a 10-year veteran. In the case of Taito Estrada, my guess is he's going to have to be sent back to Scranton. But in the case of guys like Gio Urshela or DJ LeMayhew or Cameron Mabin, I would think these would be some really, really strong guys that you would want to bring off the bench because the Yankees had a very thin bench to begin with. Why not make these guys the core of your bench in addition to bringing guys back like Gregorius, um, like Aaron Judge, 
and Aaron Hicks, and also um, uh, Giancarlo Stanton while we're at it. You well, you only allow, what, 26 players. So you got to figure how you would spread the 26 players. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one of the things that you have going for you. And even pitching, too. Yeah. You know, the pitching that you've gotten from these guys have been fantastic. Mm-hmm. And they've beaten the teams that they were supposed to beat, and they beat the teams that they were not supposed to beat. Yeah. I, I, the more I uh, talk about this with you in regards to pitching, the more I can think about um, Domingo Germán and how, how spectacular he's been. As seven the, and one. Seven and one this season. Believe it or not, Domingo Herman was the kid who they brought from the Marlins in that ill fated um trade that they made to uh to get uh one of the pitchers that's uh now on the Red Sox. And Herman wound up having a Tommy John surgery and I think he was released at one point in his career by the Yankees, and he wound up making his way back. And all he's done is do his job without any complaint, and because Luis Severino, uh, we're still not sure when he's going to be returning, Herman has been the one to really solidify that, that starting rotation. And really important, too, considering that CC Sabathia has been okay at best, Masahiro Tanaka has been up and down, and James Paxton has been solid at best, and also Jay Happ has, has been uh, very, very shaky lately. I mean, you're not, you're not expecting them to win every game because, but... No chance they're going to win every something. game. But let's put it this way. The Yankees finished the first quarter of the season 24-16. and 16. If they can duplicate that for each of the next three quarters of the season, that would give them a record of 96 wins and 64 losses, which would be more than enough to clinch a playoff spot, whether it's the division title or one of those two wild cards. And, and I would team, take that any time. The team that's duplicating, it, it seems, is Boston. Mm-hmm. Red Sox, they, I mean, they're they're on a nice winning streak, too. See, I knew that they were not going to be at the bottom of the totem pole like, like people thought they would be. The Red Sox are just too strong, and they have way too many good players to be down for such a long time. Tell you what, though, going into this series, though, Tampa was surprising a lot of people. And it wasn't just because of their pitching, either. It's because of their... Uh, Really, really solid batting order. I mean, they're they're winning games with guys like Tommy Pham and um, so many others that right. it, that they've uh, they've practically taken everyone's attention. They are winning. Give them credit where credit is due. But are they filling their ballpark? And they're not filling nope. their ballpark at all. And that's sad. Just yesterday, they drew twenty-five thousand fans against the Yankees. The most they draw for one game that does not involve the Yankees or the Red Sox is maybe eight thousand fans. It takes the Yankees to bring out a near-packed arena or stadium in, in their case. There must be a lot of Yankee fans over in Florida, too. Oh, there are plenty of Yankee fans in, in Florida. In Miami, in Tampa, in Fort Lauderdale, in Jacksonville, in Orlando, in Tampa. Anywhere you go, there are going to be Yankee fans in the state of Florida. And the Mets, you know, Cinco de Mayo was not good for them. No, not even. That road trip that they had just recently was not good for them either. They finished 1-5. And it took the Marlins for them to uh, right the ship, so to speak. But that's a team that they're supposed to beat because mm -hmm. the Marlins are not that good to begin with. Yeah. And, they're and the that's worst team Derek in baseball. Team, isn't it? What's that? Isn't that Derry Cheaters? Um, yeah. And worst that's another team in baseball. one I don't understand. He, he, again, great player Derry Cheater is, and he can't. What's happening with that team? 
What's happening with that team is the same old, same old. They've got many good players they, they, that they just cannot afford. That's why you see them uh, trading away guys like Kristen Yelich and, 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 and so many other great stars that they had in the past. And, and that's, a, that's the thing, too, that kills me. Here's a team that uh, Florida wanted. Florida wanted a team there, but they don't support them. <laughs> they, they really they really guessed wrong when they decided to expand to the Sunshine State. They really did. With so many teams out there, or should I say states out there, that really would support a team, they're not supporting a team at all. <laughs> no, they're not. And I'll tell and you right now, there's one, there's one town that would gladly welcome them back to the fold, and that's Montreal. Montreal would take in a team in a heartbeat. Well, the Kansas City Royals aren't doing that well either. No. And they don't have a farm a system. They don't have teams. any star players of any caliber. They can't pitch. They're having problems hitting. KC's going to need a long time to try and rebuild because they have no farm system to back them up. But, but that's the thing. And, and this is what the salary cap or the luxury tax is, tax is supposed to be about. Yeah. To make these teams get better, but some of the owners just pocket that money. Mm-hmm. So the league should be going up their rear ends going, hey, spend the money. Yeah. Or sell the team. I mean, I, the, the Marlins situation really surprises me because you would think that with a guy like Derek running the show, that he would want to build a contender, not try and help other teams build contenders. But that's just what he did. He traded Kristen Yelich to Milwaukee. He's the most valuable player of the league last year, and they were a game away from a World Series. But like you said, they wouldn't have been able to sign him because of, of salary. Yeah. And that's a shame because I'm sure the owner was loaded. The other problem with the Marlins is, one, they're in a market that has a, a rather older population, if you will. And, and, and it's a real shame because a lot of the guys there, the part of, I would say maybe one-third of the population is Cuban. Maybe one-third or maybe one-half of the population is all Cuban. Cuba loves their baseball. You would think that there would be a, a large Cuban population flocking to the new stadium on the site where the Orange Bowl used to be and, and taking some games, but no. That's another problem. Not spending is, is one problem. They're in a market uh, that's uh, got the wrong demographic. That's number two. Number three is... The, 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 they're in a market that is more of a tourist attraction than an actual sports attraction. The whole sports landscape in Miami has gone way down. The Marlins have long stunk. The Heat, they, they don't have Dwayne Wade anymore. He retired. So it's going to take a while for them to rebuild. Are they going to be drawing fans over to the AAA? I don't think so. And of course, there's the, uh, the long-running common denominator, the Dolphins. The Dolphins have been horrendous in the well, last... They, they're more of a college. I 15 think or 20 years or so. More of a college team than, than they are pro team. That's another thing. I don't even think they're drawn for the University of Miami either. And they're playing in a, a reconstructed stadium in Miami Gardens... Uh, Hard Rock Stadium, which should be able to draw a lot of fans, but they're not doing that either. Well, Gainesville's football team. I mean, but look how many football Gainesville teams is they different. Have. Gainesville is 390 miles north. They are able to support the Florida Gators with no problem. The same thing with Florida State in Tallahassee, which is right across the interstate. They have no problem 
drawing fans for, for Seminoles games. But you go elsewhere, you go to Orlando for the Magic, they've had problems drawing. The Rays have had problems drawing fans at Tropicana Field for maybe 15 years now. Even when they won the World Series. Even when they went to the World Series. That was, the, that was probably the only year that they were able to draw reasonably well. And even in their ensuing years, when they made the playoffs as either a division champion or a wild card, still had problems drawing. Part of the problem is they're two hours away from Tampa, and they have to take the highway, which is always packed with traffic, and they have to wait one or two hours just to get to, to the stadium. So these fans are not going to sit in traffic for one or two hours just to go to a baseball game. But name one, name one stadium that, does, that you don't have to do that with. You have to do that with Yankee Stadium, and you have to do that with Shea Stadium. Yankee Stadium's different because a lot of the fans take the subway to the games. And yeah, that's true, but you still, you know, if you take your car, you still have to go through the traffic. Traffic problem. is a, traffic is murder. Either coming off the Deegan Expressway for the uh, to go to Yankee Stadium or even coming off uh, the Belt Parkway or the LIE or even the BQE just to get to City Field for the Mets. <coughs> Yet they still manage to draw reasonably well. Well, you know, I think it's because they spend the money and they are able to keep the uh, the players. Yeah, well, that goes without saying. But Tampa's not and the only problem, though. Oakland has had major problems drawing fans to their stadium for a long, for probably since the the moment they got there in 1969, and this is their 50 year anniversary in Oakland. Even for their World Series games, there were empty seats in the well, 70s the and Dodgers the 80s. Too. Dodgers, for some reason, they're a big market team, too, and you figure people want to stay, and the Dodgers are another one. They arrive late to the games, and they leave early from the games. That's because the traffic on the freeway is a cruel joke. That's why you see so many empty seats in the beginning and the end. And um, Mickey Calloway was on uh, Mike Francesa, and he was and Francesa was hitting him with hard questions like, "What's going on with the team? And what are you doing?" And do you think he, Mickey Calloway's on the hot seat right now? No, he he should not have to be on the hot seat because, quite frankly, he's been given not a great team, but a solid team that might be able to make a little bit of noise. They just need to get some of their spare parts back. Jed Lowry, for one. And if they can get their pitching in order, because keep in mind, Jacob deGrom and Noah Syndergaard are off to some pretty slow starts. Plus, Steven Matz has been a disappointment. Jason Vargas has been very, very up and down. Zach Wheeler has been up and down. The bullpen has been a little shaky starting with Jody's Familia. Edwin Diaz has done everything asked of him. He's saved seven straight games so far. He's made, ga he's made games a little more interesting than he's supposed to by loading uh, the bases, but he's still able to get the outs when he's supposed to. Another thing is Brandon Nimmo, until just recently, has had the worst slump of his short career. That's another thing. There's also the issue of... Ahmed Rosario and his defensive problems. He cannot play shortstop to save his life right now. And because of that, the Mets had to bring in Adeni Echevarria from the minor leagues, a guy who's so much better defensively than Ahmed Rosario is. And because of that, Rosario has been uh, taken out of, the, out of the lineup for defensive purposes, and Echevarria has been made a starter at shortstop. And there's also Todd Frazier. Todd Frazier continues to have problems seeing the ball at the plate. Uh, Robinson Cano has been ordinary. He, he, he's barely like a 240 or 250 hitter so far this season. The only shining light that the Mets have right now is Peter Alonzo. Peter Alonzo has done more than enough to solidify himself as the first baseman of the future. He's had a little problems defensively, but man... 
the way he's been hitting the ball, the Met fans love this rookie now. I, I have to ask you, I want to switch gears for a moment, mm-hmm. because I want to ask you, do you think James Harden and CP3 are chokers? They're not chokers, but they're not good executors either. I'm, and I'm going to give you one big example. Game five, they should have won? Games one, two, five, and six, they should have won. Games one and two, they wound up getting screwed by the referees. You call it what you will, but they were really, really hosed on a bunch of calls. Game six, I'm going to give you an example. Okay. When the, when, the, when the Warriors were making their comeback from 17 points down, well, actually, they, I'm, I'm thinking of another game. But when the Warriors were making things interesting in the first half, Steph Curry could not buy a basket. So who was the one that picked up the slack for him? It was the other superstar, Klay Thompson. Klay Thompson was in double figures the first half. The second half, things got really close where the Rockets could make a run to try and grab the game by the throat and take it to a seventh game. But who was the one that saved them? It was Stephen Curry. He finished with what? 33 points. 33 points? 16 of those points were in the last five minutes of the game. The same amount that the Rockets had in the last five minutes of the game. He's a closer. He is a true closer. Clay Thompson is a closer. And what happened in order for the, for the Warriors to make this run that solidified everything? You look at the type of defense that the Rockets were playing. The Rockets were playing Steph Curry pretty tightly. They were double teaming him. But the danger of guarding Steph two on one is you leave somebody else open. And who was the guy that they left open? It was none other than Draymond Green. Draymond Green twice wound up creating shots for teammates. He got the ball down low to, uh, I think it was Zaja Pachulia, who wound up getting the ball to a guy on the wing, which I think was uh, Andre Iguodala. And who did Andre Iguodala find to make that big, big shot? Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson solidified the game with that shot. But then there was uh, the, 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 there's the matter of the Rockets' execution. If you're going to guard Stephen Curry without the ball, you don't take your eyes off him because if you do, even for a split second, he's getting the ball back, and he's going to create either for himself or for somebody else. And what was Chris Paul's biggest mistake? He took his eyes off of Steph Curry. Is D'Antoni fired? Yes. I didn't like the idea of D'Antoni being the coach in the first place. I I didn't like his system um, being installed with the players that he had. Quite frankly, the guy's got to go. They have to get somebody else who can take them to that next level. And you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if I saw the Rockets maybe add a third superstar in order to take them to that next level. Because after Harden, who had a a terrific series— and Chris Paul, who was garbage for the first five games, who are they going to go to? Clint Capella? Well, here's another thing that you have to think about, too, with another team, and that is Ben Simmons. Do you think that he's a good shooter? No. Ben is not a great shooter. He's a, he's a decent shooter. He's great with the ball. Uh, creating shots for others, and also uh, creating uh, to get himself to the basket. But his perimeter game is really, really bad. He's got a lot of work to do. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. I've been sending you clips Yeah. about the the, the Lakers and the New York Knicks, Mm -hmm. and you've been so great at them. And, you know, 
LeBron James is in a very bad situation out there. You think? Between the bus, Jenny Bus, Kurt Rambis, uh, and, and and so many people out there. I mean, because look look at Port Frank Vogel. You you need at least five years to rebuild the team to get a team going. They gave him three years, right? Yeah. Then they made him hire Jason Kidd. Then Kurt Rambis may be back as an assistant coach again. Wow. So, you know, how much power does Kurt Rambis has is beyond me. Who is he sleeping with? (laughs) You know? But, you know, and then I, I see a report. I mean, now LeBron James' name has been thrown around going to the New York Knicks, going to the Philadelphia 76ers for Ben Simmons. Which would have been a much better fit for him. Not necessarily for the Sixers, but a much better fit for him because he could have been a piece that would have taken the Sixers over the top. Yes, and, and, and you know, but here's another thing, too, about LeBron, and we've talked about this before, and that is, LeBron has a tendency to want to be coach, GM, and everything else. You know why? Because he, he has is not. He's a great player. Yes, and he's he, one he, of the best players in this century. He's the best player. He's probably one of the five best players of the modern era. I would put him right up there with exactly. Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan and maybe Kevin Durant. But yes. He has a, a tendency to want to take over. Notice because what he did during their championship run when he practically pulled the chalkboard, the, the, the miniature chalkboard, out of David Blatt's hands and decided to draw up a play for himself. And you were talking about the pedigree of the Lakers. Yes. That was back then. They're not the Lakers of yesteryear. And that's These the problem. The new, that, this is the new Lakers that has no identity anymore. And look that's how the fast problem. Magic Johnson left. They brought in LeBron James. And I don't think anybody wants to play for LeBron James. That's why I asked you before who would you play for, James Dolan or Jenny Buss? I'd and much Jenny rather play Buss for Jenny Buss. Uh, even forget that. Forget the pedigree because that doesn't exist anymore. It seems like nobody wants to go and play for the Lakers anymore. You know why? And they because they the slowly but Knicks. surely are seeing a very, very incompetent, inept, delusional, and clueless attitude about what kind of players to bring in. I mean, after LeBron James... You go and bring in Lance Stevenson? Seriously? You couldn't get anybody better than Lance Stevenson or JaVale McGee, who's a decent player, but he was better off staying with the Warriors. LeBron made a a huge judgment in error going to Los Angeles, all because he wanted to be closer to his production company and all because he wanted to be at his house in the in the in the Hollywood Hills, I'm looking forward to two things: the draft tomorrow. Where are they going to be at? You mean the draft lottery? Yeah, the draft lottery tomorrow, and also, will KD come? Will Kyrie come? Will Kyrie Leonard? Where will he be at? You mean Kawhi Leonard? Kawhi Leonard. Where is the other guys going? Where are these guys going? That's going to be the stuff that dreams are made of, and I'm hoping that KD comes and every and everybody else comes to the Knicks and go to the Nets as well. Well, I'm hoping that Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving can exercise better judgment and stay far away from here as no, possible. No, I think the Knicks are fine. They're they, not they, fine. They, you know, They're not fine. They are fine. No, they are they not. Are they are horrendous. Now, Dolan has not put his... Goodbye, everyone. So long, everyone. We're going to continue this discussion.